Dr. Wyatt, most of you know me. If you don't, you will shortly. Whether that's going to be a good experience or bad experience, it's up to y'all. So, talk about the esophagus today. Uh, the good Lord put the esophagus in the geometric middle of the chest, for, so it would be very difficult to get to. And technically, it's a challenging organ to, uh, number one, to expose, and number two, to repair, and number three, to resect. I've done esophageal surgery ever since I left this institution, <clears throat> and I've seen surgeons do it so many different ways, uh, and, and all of them are right if technically done correct. Uh, if you don't do it correct, the esophagus is unforgiving. There's no doubt about it. So we will talk about uh, esophageal surgery today. Our agenda for the next three days, I'll do one uh, today and one in a week from today, and then I'll be, I think, off two or three weeks and join you again for esophageal three. Today we'll go over the anatomy. Very important. Esophageal anatomy is, is uh, pretty much the same in everyone. Uh, we'll talk about injury, perforation, uh, exogenous perforations, endogenous perforations to where they're, they're inherent uh, <coughs> injuries to the esophagus from uh, instrumentation or just from uh, disease of the esophagus that tends to tear easier than others. How to repair these locally. We're not going to talk about resection today. That's going to be in esophageal three. Caustic injury, which we don't see a whole lot of. The ENT doctors see a fair amount of it, but when, you, when we are consulted for caustic injury, it's bad. It's usually for resection or perforation. An informed body. Once again, usually to the uh, ENT specialist, but when those um, pass beyond the cricopharyngeus muscle, that's when we're consulted either from perforation or they just can't get it out. Esophageal 3 will be benign and malignant disease, and I'm going to spend a whole hour, most of the hour, on esophageal resection. Because there's three ways to do esophageal resections, basically two types, but there's three, uh, uh, three types that are uh, written about, but two types that are frequently done in this institution and in elsewhere. So the anatomy, the esophagus is not very long. When you take it out, you're surprised. You go, goodness, this is going to be an organ this long, but it tends to contract because of its musculature. So it actually is only about 25 centimeters long. It's, it's a fairly flimsy organ, too. You're surprised that, it, you know, as, as, many, as much food goes through this, tons of food goes this through your lifestyle, lifetime, that, it, that it's truly an organ that is, not, it, uh, that is non forgiving, but is, is located in an area that's very difficult to get to. So we'll start off with the cervical esophagus. Uh, in this region here at the inferior pharyngeal constrictors, uh, there's only about five centimeters of cervical esophagus. It's very, very uh, liable for injuries from penetrating neck injuries. It's located uh, just posterior to the trachea, and some of these injuries are combined injuries. And when they are combined, they're very deadly. So the cervical esophagus is in this region. We don't see that very much. You'll see it, uh, hopefully, not during carotid dissections. But the only time we see a cervical esophagus is usually if you're doing a Zinker's diverticulum or if you're exposing this esophagus because of trauma. Uh, it's hard to get to. You would think that the cervical esophagus would be relatively easy, but in a thick gentleman or a thick patient, Getting back there, it's, it's, it's very, very adherent to the trachea. It's very, very adherent to the surrounding tissues. And getting it off the inferior pharyngeal constrictors uh, can be very difficult. So the cervical esophagus is in this region. Clavicle intercedes here. The thoracic esophagus begins just at the thoracic inlet. And that's about, uh, you're looking at mostly about 20 centimeters of interthoracic esophagus. And just very little of the abdominal esophagus uh, is surgically accessible to the chest. Uh, this is variable. If this hiatus is dilated and you have prolapse of the cardia into the chest, then really there's no cervical, there's no transabdominal or interabdominal esophagus. So this is it in, in a nutshell. Now, the, some of the things you need to stay away from is you're exposing esophagus, especially through the right chest. The azacus vein is over this region. The inferior pulmonary vein, especially during thoracic resection. It's, it's not, it would, in some of these real skinny people, it's very easy to injure this vein uh, while you're doing esophageal resection, and it's very easy to danger, endanger the esophagus when you're doing a lower lobectomy or when you're freeing up that inferior pulmonary ligament. Say you're back there and there's a traumatic situation where you have a hematoma and you're uncovering the uh, uh, inferior pulmonary vein or pulling the lung up off of the esophagus, it's right there. Now the thoracic duct, it's not written here, but it's in close uh, area of the, the distal esophagus in the chest, and it's easily damaged during uh, transthoracic uh, Ivor Lewis esophagectomy. Anatomy, once again, uh, there are three anatomic strictures, uh, not strictures, sphincters, rather. Uh, this is the upper esophageal sphincter, which is right at the level of the cricopharyngeus, here at the lower esophageal sphincter, and there's one here we'll show you in just a second where the aorta and the left mainstem bronchus uh, intercede in this area. 
So relationships to these structures, the cervical esophagus is usually accessed through the left neck incision, a generous left neck incision, almost down to the sternocleidomastoid, down to the suprasternal notch. Um, in the interthoracic esophagus in here, it, it's very difficult to get to. Uh, most areas of the esophagus in this area will be accessed through the right thoracotomy. The left thoracotomy is used to access only the very distal esophagus. Now you'll see some people with thoracic aneurysms, <clears throat> that there'll be some tortuosity of the esophagus, but pred predominantly, once again, cervical esophagus, left neck, interthoracic esophagus, right chest, distal esophagus, left chest. And you can use variations on the theme, uh, thoracoabdominal incisions to get to almost the entire esophagus. Normally that's not done anymore. And the left atrium is posterior to the esophagus, uh, excuse me, left atrium is anterior to the esophagus, and when transesophageal echoes are being performed, that's the best view of the heart when you're doing cardiac surgery. That transesophageal probe is located in the esophagus. It's right behind the, the left atrium. It's also anatomically important for people that are doing uh, ablations. Some of the electrophysiology surgeons, or cardiologists rather, are ablating the uh, pathways probably for atrial fibrillation in the left atrium. You can through diathermy or through high frequency can damage the esophagus. And I've seen uh, esophageal uh, atrial fistulas, are almost always deadly, but usually because of uh, uh, energy exchange between the uh, anterior aspect of the esophagus and the, the uh, posterior aspect of the left atrium. Very dangerous entity. But those are the structures right there. Now doing transhiatal, uh, like Dr. Chu does, you really need a small hand. Uh, Dr. Oranger in Michigan, who, who really kind of popularize the transesophageal or transhiatal resection. Uh, glove size less than seven and a half or eight. I know you guys have big hands who are trying to do these transesophageals. It's very dangerous. I've gotten into the left membranous portion of the left main stem bronchus. As you put your hand through that hiatus and up posterior, there's blood flow uh, from the, trans, uh, from the uh, uh, thoracic aorta. There's the membranous portion of the left main stem bronchus that you can easily get into as you wrench your hands through that area. So smaller hands are definitely an attribute uh, in this area. I quit doing that for that reason. I got into that a couple of times, and some of the bleeding off the descending thoracic aorta can be very problematic. So I, I tend to do an Ivor Lewis. So the anatomic constrictions we just talked about, the upper esophageal sphincter, it's kind of a nebulous area. When you're doing uh, EGDs, when you're doing these, you'll, you'll notice that your scope quickly passes through it and you never see it. Uh, but I can tell you, when a big piece of meat gets hung there, uh, it, it's dramatic uh, because this area is very difficult to get to with the scope uh, without damaging either the cords or the piriform sinus or, or that area. But it, once again, it's only about five centimeters in length, and the cricopharyngeus muscle, once again, is a uh, uh, kind of a marker for that. A Zinker's diverticulum is a posterior diverticulum of the esophagus. It usually goes in between the inferior pharyngeal constrictor and the cricopharyngeus. It's a, it's a pulsion diverticulum, usually because of some abnormalities and a hyperactive upper esophageal sphincter. We will go through that a little bit later. So the anatomic constrictions, once again, the lower esophageal sphincter, the transverse aortic arch, and the left main stem bronchus. So when you go in through EGD, which we'll talk about on our last, or on our next uh, topic, uh, you pass the scope, you'll feel a little constriction. That's almost always where you'll see transesophageal probes and gastroscopes get hung up. You'll, you'll have some patient to swallow. They're trying to swallow. It's a very difficult area to get past. If you feel resistance at a, you know, about five or 10 centimeters, do not push it, try, try to push it past this esophageal sphincter high up. If you do, you'll get a posterior tear. Difficult intubations, trying to cram that tube down with not really not seeing the cords. You miss the uh, epiglottis and you hit that area of the cricopharyngeus and you get a tear up there. Um, likewise, here, here's, this is the uh, lower esophageal sphincter, which we'll go into a little bit greater detail here. This is God's true great creation, a valve here, uh, that prevents reflux of acidic material into the distal esophagus. It's very difficult for people to understand. That's why there's about six different ways of reconstructing this with reflux disease. Very difficult. There's 180 degree wraps, there's 360 degree wraps, there's transthoracic, transhiatal, transabdominal, all to try to figure out on how to reconstruct this when we either get so obese uh, or for some other reason uh, the esophagus has uh, 
is no longer intra-abdominal and it's almost all intra-thoracic. You lose that pressure gradient, which is about four to six centimeters of water pressure to maintain this sphincter. And when it is uh, changed for whatever reason, either this phrenoesophageal ligament becomes lax, either because of diaphragmatic hernia or because of increased intra-abdominal pressure because of obesity, uh, as this stomach pushes up into the thoracic cavity, you lose that sphincter mechanism and reflux can happen uh, throughout the day and throughout the night. <clears throat> With the obesity that is going on in the United States today, I just saw in the paper the other day, 35% of people are obese and there's uh, about 10% uh, of our population are mega obese patients. We're seeing a whole change in esophageal pathology that's occurred even in my lifetime. The most common cause of, of esophageal cancer early in my career was squamous cell in the middle, in the middle esophagus, mostly from people who were malnourished, alcoholic, and abused tobacco. But as we move into, our, uh, in, into the new millennium, obesity now is the great cancer causer. You're gonna see that. Pancreatic cancer, breast cancers, and distal esophageal cancers. Now we have adenocarcinomas as the most common esophageal cancer. It's distally because of chronic reflux. Barrett's changes y'all read about, which we'll go into our third lecture, in addition to uh, what starts as a microinvasive adenocarcinoma and, and rapidly moves up and down this area. So whereas I used to do total esophagectomies for mid-thoracic esophageal cancers, now I'm doing esophageal gastrectomies for GE junction tumors. It's amazing how our lifestyle has changed uh, cancers, with, also with the uh, propensity of colon cancers in young people. Arterial venous and nerve supply is segmental. Different portions of the esophagus get different supplies from different organs, from different uh, blood supply drugs. The inferior thyroid artery, the cervical esophagus, the middle third is from the descending thoracic aorta, and this is where it's surprising that the transhiatal doesn't get in more uh, issues. You're bluntly dissecting these sometimes not under direct visualization, you're not electrocauterizing, you're just basically tearing them off the thoracic aorta and they, they basically tamponade themselves uh, when you bring the stomach up. So the st when you take the, st the esophagus out through a transhiatal, you pull the stomach up, it basically tamponades those small vessels that are coming off the thoracic aorta. Very seldom can you see the entire thoracic esophagus and, and stop that bleeding. It's okay though, it, it, it's an operation that works. The lower third is from the left gastric artery, which is usually ligated during uh, either esophageal procedure. The veins, inferior thyroid veins, azagous vein on the right side, which is usually taken during esophagectomy, open esophagectomy, and uh, one third uh, from the lower uh, left gastric vein. Lymphatic drainage, uh, deep cervical nodes, mediastinal nodes, and also the lower third left gastric lymph nodes and into the celiac and hepatic plexus. Cervical cancer of the esophagus is very difficult to treat uh, because of its proximity, because of its late presentation. Nervous office, no, nerve supply of the esophagus is usually through the vagus, the vagal trunks, through parasympathetics, and you can see that. It's pretty easy to see through the transthoracic, and y'all have seen, I'm sure, seen the vagus nerve at the GE junction. Histologically, uh, the epithelium, which we'll go over in just a second, in this region, lamina propria, muscularis mucosa. And in the muscularis, there's usually two layers, kind of a circular and a longitudinal layer. There's no serosa in the esophagus. You know, when you're in there sewing small bowel, duodenum, colon, those big bites of that serosa really help with the strength. You have none here. Uh, unless it's in a diseased esophagus, this area is, is, is relatively friable. You, it doesn't hold stitches well. So I, I never use a staple on the esophagus, some people do. With, with success, but I think if you don't, this has got to be a tension-free anastomosis, no doubt about it. If you try to put tension on this, you, you're destined to fail. So what I do is a three-layer anastomosis, or two-layer anastomosis on the esophagus. I get my first layer of interrupted uh, through this layer in the submucosa, uh, and the next layer through the seromuscular, excuse, not seromuscular, but the muscular, muscular layer with some adventitia uh, in this region. You're gonna ask to be, to read, uh, esophageal ultrasounds in the future. Pretty simple, actually. It shows the, the uh, inside and the middle and the outside layer of the, eso of the esophagus, and you can also see lymph nodes in this region. Usually this is done to help stage esophageal cancer, uh, endoesophageal ultrasound. Uh, it can stage it by some papers with greater accuracy than CT scan and endoscopy. And what you're really looking for is paraesophageal lymphadenopathy. Histology, 
stratified uh, squamous, there's large mucous glands to secrete into the esophagus so fluid doesn't get stuck. And as you well remember from histology, the muscularis is skeletal in the upper, mixed in the middle, and smooth in the lower. And once again, they say no peritoneum, but really no serosa, nothing. So this, this is something, this will challenge your expertise in trying to get good mobilization and also getting a good anastomosis. Eight to 10% of esophageal uh, anastomoses leak. Uh, that's because it's a technical endeavor. Usually not because of the sewing technique, it's because you don't mobilize the esophagus enough. Or you try to take too much out, you end up throwing those, sewing those posterior layers in and you're saying this is tight and it's gonna leak, I can guarantee. So you've gotta get a, a nice lax anastomosis. Okay, let's move on to injury. Any questions about the anatomy? Structure that uh, you have to know, you know when you're in the middle of a trauma or you're in the middle of somebody who comes in with a perforation, you need to remember thoracic esophagus, right side, uh, cervical left side, distal, transabdominal, or left chest. <clears throat> what causes esophageal injury? Endoscopy, frequently we're asked to, uh, to uh, come into the endoscopy sweep, somebody with subcutaneous emphysema, they had a difficult scope, uh, the GI fellow is concerned about a perforation, dilatation either from benign or malignant strictures, intubation, very common cause in a teaching institution of cervical esophageal perforation, very common. Because you see those people intubating your, peop your patients in the operating room, and usually not the staff guy. And they, well, can you see it? Oh yeah, I can see it, I can see it. They think they see the cords, they're not really looking at the cords, they're looking at the pharynx, through the pharynx, through the esophagus, into the cricopharyngeus and the surrounding tissues. They start blowing it up, you have subcutaneous emphysema there. Not all need to be treated surgically, but nonetheless, it's something with high index of suspicion. During sclerotherapy and laser therapy, much less common nowadays. Non-instrumental, barogenic trauma, Borhobs is something we're asked to see in the emergency room. Someone usually intoxicated or with some inherent esophageal problems like eosinophilic esophagitis uh, or some bad reflux. And basically, they either vomit or valsalvus in some way, shape, or fashion and tear their posterior esophagus just above the diaphragm on the left posterior aspect. It's called Borhobs. It can be a dangerous entity if you do not make the diagnosis early. Blunt or abdominal, uh, blunt chest or abdominal trauma, labor, convulsions, defecation, God forbid defecation. Uh, that's gotta be tough there. Uh, penetrating neck, chest, or abdominal trauma, <laughs> operative trauma. Uh, we can hurt the esophagus very easily in, in thoracic surgery, uh, trying to get to the lower aspect of, of the lung or the hilum, phagotomy, pulmonary resection, hiatal hernia repair, and when you're attempting to do a myotomy, either through the laparoscopic approach or the open approach, uh, you can get into the uh, mucosa and get a tear there and not recognize it. Corrosive injuries we'll talk about in a second. Erosion by adjacent infection is rare. One thing that's not here is, is uh, tracheoesophageal fistulas from cancer. That's a whole nother source. And swallowed foreign bodies. Okay. Yes, sir. So, so just for our chief residents, this chart is on their oral boards, each scenario with different uh, presentations like endoscopy suite call, corrosive injury, sure. everything for esophageal perforation. Okay, so good enough. I've got it. On your oral boards, yeah. The locale has a lot to do with the etiology. Instrumental can happen anywhere. As you can see here, spontaneous or Borhobs, uh, usually in the thoracic cavity. I don't believe this. I think the, uh, I would say 90% of Borhobs is usually leaking into the left chest with the left pleural effusion, not into the abdominal area. Trauma can happen anywhere, but mostly in the cervical, usually from penetrating neck injuries or gunshot wounds. You can actually see cervical esophageal injuries from hyperextension, uh, chiropractic maneuvering, things like that. You can cause that usually from some sort of bony prominence in the cervical spine. And when you uh, hyperextend that neck, it tears in the posterior aspect of the esophagus. Very rare, but it can still happen. Foreign bodies usually happen in the cervical esophagus, just distal to the cricopharyngeus muscle here, but can happen also in the thoracic. And operative can happen anywhere, no matter where uh, you are, a misadventure could occur. What are some of the symptoms in the upper esophagus? Chest pain and neck pain, dysphagia, drooling sometimes even, respiratory distress. When somebody's torn their esophagus in the cervical region or in the, low, or in the thoracic inlet, 
they feel they're, they're nervous. Something bad's happened. I had a guy came that came in from a Mexican restaurant one time, and they were having some kind of chip eating contest. You know, bad set of chips, unfortunately, because it tore his posterior esophagus. I said, goodness, it didn't sound like that could occur, but he had eosinophilic esophagitis. So not a normal esophagus. He didn't know he had that. What we found was a posterior tear up here, and this guy, he, he, was, he, he had to come off the bed. He felt he was going to die immediately. And what he developed was a rapidly descending mediastinitis. Uh, he kept trying to swallow, kept trying to drink fluids, and basically opened up this little tear, and it propagated down his mediastinum. And when people get mediastinitis acutely, it's bad. They, they can't sit still. It's like a thoracic aneurysm. It's like something that's about to happen to me in a bad way. Lower esophagus, they get abdominal pain, pain radiating to the back. You can have pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, subcutaneous emphysema. Uh, now, pneumomediastinum is something that's never covered under one topic, but we see a lot of these transferred from outside hospitals. Okay, we got a patient with pneumomediastinum. I know uh, Rachel and I have had several of these come in, and we don't know where it's from. Obviously, you have to take them. But if you look at the chance of having an esophageal or upper airway tear with everyone who comes in with, uh, with uh, pneumomediastinum, it's about 10%. 90%, we never find the cause, whether it's a subpleural bleb, whether it's something in the lung that just happens to pop and we don't see it, they don't develop a pneumothorax, we don't know. But in people with esophageal tears, 75% of those get pneumomediastinum. In an upper airway tear, either for whatever reason, almost 100% will have pneumomediastinum. So when we see the people coming in from the ER, one in 10, and our level of, of, of suspicion is kind of low, we kind of blow them off, oh, well, this is another, you know, God knows what they were doing at home to cause this, but you still have to investigate. Number one, the big, th this big thing is, it's just history and physical. Uh, some, some of these will have nausea, some of these will have nausea and vomiting, some of these will have nothing at all other than pneumobediastinum. I tend to be very conservative and watch these patients. If there's any sign of infection, uh, tachycardia, crepitus, that's outside the thoracic cavity, then you have to investigate with usually upper arrow digestive uh, endoscopy. Question. Mm -hmm. Something I never quite understood is like when you over that you over uh, bagging somebody and they get barotrauma and they develop pneumomediastinum. Right. And like you said, maybe a subpleural bleb has, has popped, but the lungs are isolated by pleura. Why does it cause pneumomediastinum and not a pneumothorax? Oh, well, you have to pop the, the the visceral pleura is tough. It really is tough. Uh, so they can pop a bleb in the air instead of going through the pleura will go along the airway into the mediastinum, into the pericardium. I've had pneumopericardium and never could find out. I was a, a, one of the physicians on an Ironman races in Hawaii for three years and about three people a year out of 2,000 would get pneumomediastinum just from exercise. We don't know why. We, we, we knew they didn't vomit. We knew they were very dehydrated. We knew they were at the uh, extents of their physical uh, challenges, but we don't know why they develop it. Every year they get pneumomediastinum. We think it's from swimming, they get nervous, they're in the, they're in the water, and uh, they, they start having some chest pain when they get out of the water, and they go ahead and continue on the 112 mile bike. They finish the bike, they have to stop because of this chest pain, and a lot of them will have this just from getting so excited and pumped up that they have a valsalva during the swim, and it pops into their pleural. Odd. Some of the symptoms, once again, uh, <clears throat> Neck, substernal epigastric pain, esophageal, not necessarily specific for esophageal perforation. But with this history of vomiting, hematemesis, or dysphagia, you've got to think, of the, think about it. And esophageal, esophageal perforation is very much like aortic dissection. It's a great masquerader. Differential diagnosis, MI, pancreatitis, perforated peptic ulcer disease, aortic dissection, gastric virus is real rare. But symptoms vary on site. A mechanism and interval to presentation, pain is the most consistent, uh, along with tachycardia and fever. Subcutaneous emphysema, crepitus, pleural effusion, sepsis. Rapid diagnosis is the key to getting this. 1% per hour if you, missed a if you miss a thoracic esophageal perforation. I reviewed our, our uh, experience here in uh, 1992. We had 53 esophageal perforations. Most of them were thoracic. 75% of percent of them presented late with em, almost like empyemas and pleural fluid. Most of these could not be repaired primarily. So rapid diagnosis is important. Chest x-ray, nonspecific sometimes, just emphysema, pleural effusion, hydronemothorax, 
You could see this with empyema. Gastrograph and swallow, 10% of them will be missed because it's so thin it just goes right beyond, right beyond the tear. So you really need thin barium. Thin barium if your index of suspicion is high. And CT scan of the chest, in addition to thin barium swallow, is about 95% sensitive and specific. So if you combine those two, usually the CT scan's done first. They'll say, oh, you got an esophageal tear. I never make the diagnosis of esophageal tear on CT scan, because what you're seeing, very rarely do you see extravasation of the oral dye into the mediastinum. What you see is emphysema around the esophagus. And you're going, but where is it? Am I just going to explore the esophagus? Absolutely not. You have to know where this tear is. If you don't demonstrate a tear and you open yourself up to, okay, where am I going to go into the chest? To the right, to the left, to the neck? You don't know. Very important to localize that tear preoperatively. Plain chest x-ray, subcutaneous emphysema, pneumopericardium here. Uh, very important. When you see that, something's wrong. This is not the pneumomediastinum we see coming from the ERs. What we'll see is just a little hint on CT scan. Radiologists pick it up. Uh, what you see here is something bad wrong, either an uh, arrow, upper arrow digestive tear, bronchial tear, or, or some sort like that. Sorry about the reconstruction on this, but what you'll see here is emphysema. This looks like a honeycomb type of esophagus where there's actually air in the wall. Uh, same here, uh, longitudinal air in the esophagus along the stripe. This is bad, bad news. This, is just, this didn't just happen. This is something where you have a huge little uh, infectious process posterior to the trachea. So this esophagus in the upper thoracic area is being held in by the uh, visceral, or excuse me, the parietal pleura and visceral pleura. Uh, there's really not much of an effusion. This is bad news. This is probably an esophageal tear uh, that's over 24 hours old. And this is the Frank Gastrographin study that shows extravasation here. This is a big tear. This is a Boerhaave's right here. Sometimes you'll see just little, almost like a pseudoaneurysm you'd see in an artery. Some of these tears are, are minuscule and actually drain back into the esophagus, esophagus and can be treated expectantly with antibiotics. This is something that, uh, similar to a patient I saw, a little lady who came in who was very sick. She was already intubated. And just, she, this is what I'm presented with. Okay, they wanted me to see her for an empyema. Go in for the empyema. Couldn't do, the, do it with the scope. We opened her up. Her esophagus had been torn probably six days. She died because of a delayed diagnosis of esophageal perforation from a fish bone. And what happened was is the tear started relatively innocuously and small and then propagated and got bigger and bigger every time she ate. And uh, gosh, I, I, it's amazing. She went to the ER three times with pain. And nobody kind of blew her off because she was young uh, and basically died from her disease. So what are our algorithm for esophageal perforation? Or this could be anything. Esophageal injury, esophageal perforation, Boerhaave's instrumentation. So if you uh, suspect it from your physical examination, and your history. Chest x-ray is a must. I think contrast is a must and CT. EGD is plus or minus. They can miss 25% of the tears. And how many of you want to blow more acid into the mediastinum with an EGD? So I don't use EGD very seldom unless there's some sort of foreign body in there with the perforation, like a meat impaction or some foreign body, maybe somebody swallowed uh, some either caustic substance or, or, or a foreign body that could perforate the esophagus. So if you have a free perforation and it's in the cervical region, you can almost always just open that up and drain it and put a drain in. You do not have to find the tear. Why would you expect that the cervical esophagus can be treated with just open drainage without actually having to find the cut or the tear? Well, the surrounding tissues. See how tight the neck is? So it's really, it's the surrounding tissues that hold the perf in. Thoracic, loose areolar tissue, abdominal area, loose areolar tissue that's going to spread. So the neck is really a compact structure. So everything holds that in, whether it's a sternocleidomastoid, the carotid sheath, uh, whatever it is, it holds in the inferior uh, pharyngeal constrictors. Now, if this is a contained perforation, basically what you find on, on the, the, the study where they swallow, that there's a little diverticulum that it drains back into the esophagus. There's no mediastinitis, no fevers. No exquisite chest pain, although there may be a little pain associated with it, and there's no sepsis. You can treat those with plus or minus NG drainage, IV antibiotics, NPO, and maybe some TPN in any location, not just the neck. If it's a thoracic abdominal perforation with 
no underlying disease, you try to get in there and repair it as soon as possible. That's easier said than done. Uh, the, the, the Frank Netter pictures that show you the esophagus nice and beautiful and with a little tear in it never exist. Even within the first eight hours, you get in, the esophagus is swollen, you can't identify the mucosa, submucosa, and what happens is usually you put big hunkering bites down through that esophagus and you get esophageal stenosis or you don't get the tear and they re-leak. But if they have underlying disease, uh, the chance of you definitively managing this with an esophagectomy is also rare. The, the cases you'll see in your training and also out outside, most of these will be delayed eight to 10 hours by the time they reach a surgeon. That's sad, but true. So definitive repair occurs usually, which would mean esophagectomy uh, or a, maybe a, a stenosis or some sort of uh, esophageal stricture in about five to 10% of the cases. Diversion is not a great operation in itself either. T-tube into the, into the tear, sometimes a stent excision and drainage. The worst, the worst thing you can do with these patients is just stick a chest tube in and have a controlled fistula. They will die almost every time, especially in someone who presents who are older. Even the young people will die. If you say, okay, I've got an empyema, I'm going to stick a chest tube in this and drain the esophageal perforation, they'll never live. Their sepsis and their mediastinal sepsis will continue, and that, that's really not a controlled fistula. So you really have to do something with diversion, which usually is a cervical esophagostomy, in cervical esophagostomy, Staple the esophagus above and below the tear, chest tube drainage, and usually a J-tube of some sort. It's a big operation, and the reconstruction is very tough, but sometimes it will save their life, especially with advanced cases. Just another algorithm very similar to the, to the last. Uh, if, if you don't get better after 24 hours, when you think you have a suspected small leak, you need to go ahead and look at it sooner than later. Uh, yeah, I think we control this. The control fistula is bad. Exclusion and diversion is, is uh, usually the 75 percent exclusion and diversion are done in patients who can't have a repair. It's, it's not a great operation. Uh, occasionally, early on, they call you from the GI suite and they have a tear. You can go in and fix those within the first six to eight hours. While it's not necessarily that easy, it's the best thing for the patient. So here are the five types, I think, of uh, not just perforation, but also for trauma, whether it's blunt uh, or perforating trauma or penetrating trauma. Primary repair of the perforation, basically just interrupted vicrals in the mucosa and then interrupted silks outside of that in drainage with an NG tube in. And make sure you don't catch your NG tube with your mucosal stitches. Uh, you really have to pass that NG tube through the esophagus by holding it and allowing the anesthesiologist to pass it, have them tape it in so it's not pulled out. And make sure when you throw those stitches, you don't catch a little hole in that, that NG tube because when you go to pull it out, it's not coming. And you got another operation on your hands. So you, you don't want that. Primary repair of the perforation with a, either a thaw patch. Anybody know what a thaw patch is? A thaw patch is actually the Dr. Thaw was at uh, Parkland in Dallas, uses a flap of the stomach to go over a distal esophageal tear. And you just almost do like a small nissen of some sort just to repair that. A thaw patch in the duodenum is usually just uh, some, some sort of portion of the, of the uh, stomach that's wrapped over the, the duodenal tear. So it's Dr. Thal uh, popularized that. Temporary exclusion of the perforated esophagus we talked about, drainage procedures. Uh, this is not good uh, in partial or total esophageal resection. There's no good operation for the delayed esophageal tear, uh, diagnosis. Very difficult. This is what Frank Netter sees. This is not what I see. You, you have. You have uh, muscularis, you have mucosa, and what you really need to do, if, it, if you see this big ugly area that's just puckered up and you just see the nipple of bile coming out or, or succus coming out of there, open that, that muscularis up a little bit more so you can see the mucosal tear. You open it up a little bit more, you can see it better. Although you have a bigger hole, you'll be able to fix it better in the long run and either run or interrupt it, the, the uh, mucosa and then interrupt it to that. And this is the inner, this is an ideologic intercostal muscle flap that you put over that. Never been able to do that. All right, something that's not very pretty but is very dangerous. Uh, uh, caustic injury of the esophagus is, uh, is always on the exams. Uh, how often do we see it? Very rarely. Uh, I've done, I think, in 30 years, I've done maybe five total esophageal repairs for someone who had lye ingestion. Well, you have to know it, so let's we'll, we'll do the work. It could be acidic or alkaline. It could be accidental homicidal or suicidal, accidental in children, 
uh, mentally retarded and intoxicated people, uh, suicidal in adults, and the acidic, is hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, or lesser common acetic acid. This is more of a, a, a mild acid here. Alkalis are the worst ones, there's no doubt about it. Lye and cleaning agents. Now, why someone would want to hurt themselves this way is beyond me. <clears throat> Pathophysiology, you have to really look at their aerodigestive tract because a lot of times people will kind of have a second thought, oh, should I be doing this? They aspirate some down their windpipe and then they get in se severe trouble. So the amount of the, uh, the uh, caustic agent and the nature of the agent, accidental. Uh, the acid ingestion causes coagulation necrosis, which limits the depth at the esophagus and it tends to hurt the stomach more. The alkali tends just to bake the esophagus immediately and it doesn't hurt the stomach. So that's something they always ask. When you have an alkali ingestion, uh, which is worse for the esophagus? So the alkali, obviously the pH is about 14 usually. It's tasteless and odorless. That's why it's more deadly. Acid, when you try to swallow acid, you really understand quickly that, hey, I, I don't want to do this. But with the alkali, uh, you get, uh, you can take a, a whole bottle and just keep chugging it. And you get liquefaction, liquefaction necrosis, direct extension, and very deep injuries. And so this, this content is interesting in the oral exam. They will ask you why acid is less uh, versus alkali. And they're, usually they're not supposed to ask the content of your knowledge in the oral exam. But in the software, if they do, they will ask you why. Really? Yeah, it's interesting. They will say you have this costing ingestion, acid versus alkali. They will ask you which causes more and why. Yeah, well, it's a very interesting exchange you have in the, in the room at that time. I've seen both of these, and mostly with what happens with acid, as soon as it gets up to the, uh, the swallowing reflex, they aspirate it into their lungs. So you end up getting a horrible pneumonitis, not much esophageal injury. I've never seen a real bad esophageal injury for, for acid injection. So if you're man enough or woman enough to, to swallow this stuff, God help you. Uh, the alkali is much different, obviously. It's, it's, it's deep injury, uh, partial neutralization. You do not want to induce emesis with this, NG tubes, uh, plus or minus. And sometimes the, the uh, pylorus spasms, when the pylorus spasms, it can't empty and it stays into the, it stays in the, the, uh, the GI tract. Histologically, this is what you see. This is the normal mucosa here. You see necrosis of the mucosa. And this is the early stage here. What you'll see later on is just frank desmoplasia of this area and scarification. And that happens long. And it continues year after year after year with the, with the lie injuries. How do you grade this? There's usually three or four stages. Um, this is done endoscopically through EGD. And you really need someone who's seen these, a lot of these. Um, you need to be in conjunction either with your gastroenterologist or a surgeon who's seen caustic injuries before. This is normal, grade one, just edema and hyperemia. Usually you see this with acidic. With, uh, with basic uh, or alkali injuries, you'll see grade two and above. And these are self-explanatory here. Endoscopically, this is a, a grade one, hyperemia, small punctate ulceration in grade two, three, you have bleeding, three B. And this is when you see a white mucosa you have frank necrosis here. Uh, this, this looks benign, but it really is not because it just, it's just ameliorated all of the normal structure of the esophagus, and there's some perforations hidden behind some of these, uh, these secretions. Caustic ingestion, number one, clinical evaluation. You really have to do chest x-rays, abdominal films. You can't just think of the esophagus. You have to think what's distal to that because of the, the exposure. And you also have to think about aspiration. If there's perforation, obviously, you have a mess on your hands. Do you immediately reconstruct? Do you divert and, and uh, do some sort of colonic or jejunal interposition? Or has the stomach been damaged uh, beyond repair where it can't be used as a conduit for reconstruction of the esophagus? Of the esophagus? So they need, all need esophagoscopy. I say that they need bronchoscopy because you have upper aerodigestive issues early on, CT of the neck, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. It also helps you evaluate uh, what you could be using for a conduit later on. You grade the injury with the, the EGD, grade one and two, which is just hyperemia without deep ulceration, can be admitted, MPO, they get proton pump inhibitors. Most of the people will get either a barium or they'll do another EGD later in their hospitalization. And these patient, patients need to be followed at three months, six months, and a year, and on farther, because <clears throat> it's very difficult to tell 
in, in grade two injuries, which is going to have uh, severe stenosis later on and long-term sequelae of their ingestion. Patients that have 2B and 3 are, are really sick. They, they usually have pneumonitis in association with this, and they have to be admitted MPO, proton pump inhibitors, and some people will actually get diverted either through tracheostomy and J-tubes. Caustic ingestion, uh, the sequelae of this, one-third of all caustic injuries will develop strictures, more likely in 2 and 3, especially 2B and 3A. <clears throat> and the chance of esophageal carcinoma, this is almost always on your test, uh, is, is dramatically higher, a thousand times higher compared to the general population. And it's usually with alkali because you get a deeper burn. The stomach is much more forgiving with these injuries. Most people will start surveillance earlier than this, usually about 10 years afterwards. They start they're doing routine esophagectomies. Most of these patients are getting dilated. They're getting dilated year after year, if not month after month. It may have been already a, a candidate for esophageal replacement. So if you get a stricture from the, of the esophagus from these uh, caustic ingestions, early chronic stage, late chronic stage, balloon dilatation, usually by the gastroenterologist, you can temporarily stent to get them through, but usually they need esophageal replacement with either a colonic interposition or a trans, uh, excuse me, or a jejunal. I'm going to move on here for the foreign bodies. I've got about five minutes. <clears throat> foreign bodies of the esophagus, usually in the pediatric population, 75% in the pediatric population, 70% are at the upper, just below the cricopharyngeus, 15% in the mid, and 15% in the lower. In the adult, most of the patients who have foreign body uh, usually have diseased esophageal issues in the beginning. Strictures, bad reflux, hiatal hernias. Symptoms, drooling, vomiting, regurgitation. This is mostly in the pediatric population. What is most common? Coins and plastic toys you'll see in the children. The adults do weirder things, I'll tell you that. Uh, <laughs> button batteries, multiple magnets, a big problem. As you know, they enter into the GI tract and they meet each other, cause fistulae and perforation. Radiolucent sharp, sharp objects. What needs intervention? Something lo lodged in the, cricoid, in the cricoid notch. Battery buttons in the esophagus. Food impaction in the esophagus. You cannot wait on these. Sharp objects and multiple magnets. Close observations. Battery buttons in the stomach usually will pass. Large objects in the stomach and uh, sharps. Once again, as we just reviewed this. If it's greater than two by six, normally it's not going to pass out of the stomach and then lead an early operation. What do you see? What are the damage? Coins, 2.5% uh, of the time they cause problems. Not too bad. You can usually watch these. Mallory Weiss tears and some of these battery buttons. So 20% of battery button batteries have, have damages uh, to the patients. Sharp objects, about 10%. Magnets, big time. You've got to get the magnets and the uh, batteries out quickly. This is a physician, believe it or not. Uh, this was in the New England Journal of Medicine. He had a fish bone in the back of his throat and he tried to get a spoon to get it out. Hmm, real smart, huh? So that's what you'll see. You'll see some odd things in both ends of the GI tract. I'll just leave, leave it to that. This is normally what you'll see. You'll have the, the, the ENT the doctor uh, see a, a battery button or a coin right below the cricopharyngeus. This is almost, can always, almost always be taken out with a, a scope. This is when uh, Dr. Delafontaine's on call. Uh, <laughs> Somebody swallowed all of these. This is something that I've, I saw quite routinely in psychiatric patients who continue to swallow things. It's almost a pathologic entity where they can't not put things in their abdomen. Piriform sinus is where you'll see a lot of things lodged. The ENT doctors normally take care of that before it gets in, into the uh, airways. Uh, you'll, you'll, it's very difficult to tell sometimes whether these are in the upper esophagus or in the upper airway. And I think ENT assistance there is very, very important. Impacted. Chicken, big time. People usually with esophageal strictures distally, that's how you find them. They start eating chicken, they don't swallow it, they don't chew it well, they come in with mid-sternal chest pain. You scope them, you pull the esophagus out, either they have a cancer or a Schatzky's ring or some sort of uh, stricture in that area. Coins, and this is pretty much what we just went through, suspected foreign body, you need x-rays, you need PA and laterals, something more anterior, maybe in the windpipe or in the trachea. Something more posterior will be in the esophagus. Basically endoscopic removal, uh, 8 to 12 hours of observation with these coins, most of them. But if you have magnets, if you have batteries, if you have sharp objects greater than 2 by 6, you're usually going to have to take them out. 
that's all I have. I don't have any questions. I had some good, tough questions for you, but we're kind of lacking on time. And uh, we will do the question and answer session at the end of the, of the soft deal, too. Any questions on this? So, yeah. Well, there's actually a compendium of what these things look like on x-rays. So if you're not sure it's a magnet, uh, you, some, some of them are not real ready to pay. Uh, but most of the time, they're of the same size. Uh, it's, it's hard to pull a magnet apart. So normally they stuck together up in the esophagus. So once they get in the GI tract, unless they swallow one, then they swallow another, and one passes and they meet, it's kind of a rare entity. But 50% damage to the GI tract, so you've got to get them out. All right, thank you very much.